legends of our time on GBC News and Ghana Television. My name is Gifty AJ, and as usual, on Legends of Our Time, we celebrate our heroes. Now, today we are privileged to meet Ghana's first woman to be called a professor of law. Having spent most of her professional career teaching at the University of Ghana, in 2003, she made headlines when the government of Ghana nominated her to serve a judge of the International Criminal Court, ICC, and later becoming the vice president of the court. Our gem has represented Ghana on several platforms, including the United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women Committee. In all this, she worked hard and raised the flag of Ghana so high to the best of her abilities. My guest for today is Professor Ikua Kwenyinia. Hello, ma'am. It's a pleasure meeting you. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much. So, how are you coping now on pension? What do you do? What's your day like? I wish I were on retirement. <laughs> <laughs> because my day is full of meetings and such things. Okay. So do you get time to rest? Sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes. Sometimes. That, that's good. Now, let's begin with your background. Uh, tell us about your early childhood. When we mention Professor Queen here, whom exactly are we talking about? Where were you born? Your parents, your siblings, your village? What do you know? Tell us. Well, I was born in a Kroponga Kroponga. So you are not an ever? No, I'm not an ever. Just because I'm married to Aneve doesn't mean that I'm Aneve. Okay. <laughs> I was born 73 years ago, this January. To my parents, my mother was a teacher. My father was uh, a chemist. chemist. What today probably we call him a pharmacist, but well, what I know is that he was a chemist. And uh, I went to school. I didn't even go to school. My hometown is Ebiru, which is next to Akropong. I think the midwife was in Akropong. That's why I was born in Akropong <laughs> <laughs> and not in Ebiru. Okay. But uh, before you go to your educational background, what kind of family did you come from? You know, how was it growing up? What had the memories share with us? Those that you remember. Uh, I came from what you would call a middle class family. My father was very well off. Very, very well off. My mother, not so. Teachers are not that well off. But they are not the poor of the community. True. You know, they are very highly respected and all that. I have, my mother has five other children. Unfortunately, we lost one a few years ago. Mm. So there were four girls and two boys, okay. making six of us. You are the number one. Number one. Okay. I'm the number one of my mother. My father had other children. Okay. So you know how many siblings? No. Don't ask me. <laughs> okay. Don't remember. Okay. You let it go. So mm. I had a very happy childhood. Share with us some of the memories. The memories. I was born on the first of January, so you can imagine that every first of January it's a party. in our house is a party. We don't have a Christmas party. Mm -hmm. We have a New Year's Day party. Every year of my life, mm -hmm. every single year of my life has been a party mm -hmm. on the first of January. Mm -hmm. So all every all the goodies are reserved for the first of January. And all my friends and all our cousins, everybody will come for a big celebration. Um, we lived between my grandmother's house, my grandfather's house, and our house. Was Christmas time was a very happy time mm -hmm. because you run from your mother's house to your grandmother. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother was a very good cook. Wow. And her food was so lovely. Mm -hmm. 
that we, whenever we came on holidays, we, st we didn't eat <laughs> at home. You ran we, to the house. We always ate. In. And if you went to my grandfather's house at meal times, he gave us all the meat and his food. So that was something that we also cherished very much. Coming to think of it, you know, I used to think that my grandfather's house was a big house mm -hmm. because there were so many people and all the children were there. My grandfather was this patriarch, you know, presiding over the family. And as soon as we arrived and there's eating, we got all the meat. Or if they are killing the goat <laughs> or a sheep, they say we should be given the liver and everything to, to roast the in the fire is. and yeah. eat. So we had. It was so much fun, it was so much fun. But of course, my mother being a teacher in the Presbyterian educational system, we didn't stay in one place for too long. Every year or two, we got transferred to some place or there. So I don't have primary school classmates. I don't remember. Because it kept on moving. Because every year or two, we moved to a different place. So. So, Professor, um, growing up, did it ever occur to you that, you know, someday you become a national asset? Oh, it, I it. I was a village girl. Mm -hmm. So how? Not really. So what would you say? But mm -hmm. I must say that my parents made me feel that the sky is always the limit. My father especially blessed us all the time. How did he do it? When I was eight years old, my two half-sisters and I were having a chat with him. So he asked my older sister, what do you want to do when you grow up? I was eight. I didn't know what I wanted to do. My sister said, oh, that's why she wanted to be a nurse. So my father said, okay, so a nurse you'll be, mm -hmm. but you go to the top of your profession. Amen. And she did. Okay. And you, what did you see? And I said, oh, I don't know. He said, you, only the best is good for you. You wow. go to Achimota School and you go to Oxford. He said that? My father said that. I was eight years old. And you went he to said, Oxford? And the day I got to Oxford, I got to my room, put my stuff down, sat down, and I cried my heart out. Why? Because I wish my father were alive oh. to see me in Oxford. I was eight. He always used to say that only the best is good for you. You will do things that nobody can imagine. He was always blessing us. And so I always tell people that when they have children, they should bless them. Because what you say with your mouth comes through. Never curse your child. Always bless them. My father died when I was very young. I was in Achimota School, Form 1. The day I was going to Form 2, 22nd September 1960. My father died that day. The fees, of course, had been paid. Um, he had called me the day before. I was with my grandmother that he would pick me and take me to school. In the morning, my aunt came and said he was dead. He had died in the night. Wow. He was very young. He was about 45. 45. So, it was, what do I do? My mother sat me down and said, education is very important. If you want to go to school, I'll do everything to make sure you stay in Achimota, you finish and you continue. But remember, you're not going to get all the goodies. So because when my father was there, every two weeks, he visited, and the car, the boot was full of provisions, mm. biscuits. Dada B. <laughs> oh, yes, I was a real Dada B. And at mother school was full of them anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> at the time. <laughs> but you are not going to get any of that. I said, fine. So long as I could go to school. And she did. She made sure I went to school. At mother school, the fees were 90 pounds a year that time. 30 pounds a term. Okay. With the extra stuff. That was huge. Then. It was a huge amount of money. How can a teacher afford it? But she did. And how, how did she, she manage? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. So but she was very determined that I will not leave the school. Of 
because my father had paid my fees. I hear when we checked it, the money he had paid, they covered my fees up to Form 3. Wow. So the rest. But you know, sixth form was government scholarships. So okay. Once you finish O levels, the worst part was over. Okay. Sixth form, you had a government scholarship to go to sixth form. So, and I was still with Tachimota School. Sixth no, form. I. You know, I was very young. I didn't know what I wanted to do. When I finished form five, I said to my mother, "Oh, I've finished form five. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go to this one. They say this one is too difficult. Okay. He said, not on your little life. You are going to go to six four. Mm -hmm. By the time I finished daily dialing, Achimota School had taken it. So they found the school. They found Ghana, a Ghana Secondary School in Florida for me. So I went to six form there mm -hmm. and did my six form. And you passed? Of course. My God, we, we passed. Um, I went to the University of Ghana to read law, but that was purely by chance, not because I really wanted to be a lawyer. What happened? I don't know. We went, when we were filling our forms, sixth form, application form for university, we were sitting in the classroom. Somebody said, oh, me, I'm going to the science department. Mm -hmm. Somebody said, oh, ask me, I want to teach. I said, me, teacher. Mm -hmm. La, la, la. The teachers <laughs> are too poor. I don't want to be. <laughs> but your mom was a teacher. Yeah, but she wasn't rich. Wow. <laughs> so I said, uh, somebody said, ah, so law. I said, yes, that's mm -hmm. a great idea. Mm -hmm. That's where the money it's is. It's very versatile. Mm -hmm. If you do law, you can do so many other things. So I put law there. But in those days, we had to do an entrance exam for, to get into law. Mm -hmm. Apart from A-levels, okay. you did an entrance exam and you did an interview. But it didn't put me off. I took the entrance exam, passed, did the interview, passed, and got into law. Right. So I came to Walter Hall in the University of Ghana to read law. For how many years? In those days, we did four years. Okay. We did three years for a degree, okay. and a year for the professional training. So we did four years. Four years. All in Lakon. Mm -hmm. We didn't go to law school. Okay. Okay. And when I started, my first year. I enjoyed it so much, but I realized that I would rather teach than mm, practice. practice law. So that's how. And I had two of my professors at the end of the first year, they called me separately and said, you did very well. So please continue because then you can continue to train and come and teach in the faculty. Wow. So they literally mentored me through my education and my university education and i applied to good oxford to do my masters got a university of ghana scholarship again it wasn't easy you had to go through an interview okay and i remember professor kwapong kwapong was a huge figure he was a vice chancellor at the time when i was a student okay. so then I said, why should the university pay for you to go <laughs> to oxford and what did you and say? And I said, because I'm very good. <laughs> and he didn't stop telling people this till he died. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> he will, he'll meet me and said, this is my niece. <laughs> she believes in herself. And I said, no, I didn't. It's not that I believe in myself. Mm -hmm. I thought that, well, what does it take to go to mm -hmm. university? It's just studying. Mm -hmm. so I said, more than I am very good. And the investor will not regret giving me a scholarship. And they did not regret. Wow. Because wow. I went and I came back and I taught. Wow. Like you said, I was the first female lecturer at the law faculty. It was all male. Okay. There were no women there. I was the first woman to be employed. Mm -hmm. The rest is history. That's remarkable. You know, uh, uh, um, so your very first day at the faculty, uh, how many students were you in charge the of? How was right now, in teaching? Yeah, at the university. Oh, if when I was there, it was 35 students. Each class was 35 yeah. students, very mm -hmm. small. Mm -hmm. By the time I came back to teach, it was about 60, 60 per class. Okay. Uh, but then it kept going up. Mm -hmm. Now I don't know what it, it is. Now the numbers are huge. You yeah. know what, my, my concern is, 
uh, I've been signaled to take a quick break. When we come back, I'll, I'll let you know my comments. You're watching Legends of Our Time on GBC News and Ghana Television. My name is Gifty J, and my guest for today is Professor Ikua Kwenia, uh, the first woman law professor in Ghana. We'll take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll have more for her to tell us. Welcome back. It's still Legends of Our Time on GBC News and Ghana Television. And today we have with us um, Professor Ikua Kweni here, the Ghana's first law professor. Uh, uh, Prof, b before we went for the break, I told you I have a concern. And my concern is the fact that today we have a lot of um, student lawyers who can become lawyers. Why is it so? Well, the law, uh, you can get a law degree from any university, but to be able to practice as a lawyer in Ghana, you have to have a professional qualification. That means you have to go to Makola? Yes, you have to go to Makola, or the equivalent of Makola. And you have to take certain prescribed subjects to be able to practice law in Ghana. And, you know, now we have a, a lot of universities private universities yeah. in the country. Like Mount, Mount Crest? Like Mount Crest, yes. Mount Crest. And they are all running Zen. law programs. Mm -hmm. And so there are more law students coming out of with law degrees than in the past when it was only the University of Ghana and then Kian University. Kian University. So, and Makola is not that big. You know. So, obviously they can't take everybody. So what should, what should we do? What would you propose? Well, the, the General Legal Council is working on it. They're looking at various ways of creating other opportunities, equivalent law schools in other institutions mm -hmm. where the students can go and do their professional courses. So I don't think we have a, a bottleneck now, but I think very soon that will be resolved because okay. it's being looked at very seriously. But uh, in your during your time, you made mention that you, you didn't have to go to Makola before no. you could become a lawyer. We did it everything in at the University at of Ghana. University. So why do you think well, it's about time? Well, there were 35. Remember, I said there are 35 students in a class. That was very small. Very, very small. 35 graduating students mm. every year. That mm. really didn't call for a big infrastructure requirements so we can it could be done very easily at the university of Ghana. but can't we add it like have uh, instead of having like three four years at the university and then you go to makola for two years why don't why can't we have like five six years at the university listen the i think practical that and the theory all combined you come out and you're a lawyer yeah but you need people to teach those who teach the professional course are the professional practitioners okay. because really you are being taught how to practice law okay. and a lot of those subjects are very practical subjects where the, which the academic law, uh, lecturers may not necessarily be interested in teaching okay. if you go back and look at the history of the law school a lot of the lecturers there are professional experienced practitioners who impart their knowledge to their students and it will be a while before we can get that many to do. And we have very huge classes, a uh, huge number of students. At the law school, I'm sure they have more than 150 students at any one time. Okay. So okay. these are issues that will be resolved yeah. with time. Okay. Yeah. But, but why do you think a lot of people are going into this particular profession? What well, is it? it is something is that, that you that can do. do. It is it's a job, it's a, a profession that you can practice well into your old age, mm. you know. Mm. And you would always be able to have a, a means of living. Law is very versatile. Mm. You do a law degree, you don't have to be a lawyer. You sure. don't have to practice as a lawyer. Mm. There are so many things that you can do. Mm. And especially when a lot of people are coming to the age of retirement, they realize that 60 is very young for people mm -hmm. to retire. Mm -hmm. And so they would like to keep themselves occupied. And so they yeah. go and get themselves a law degree. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
qualify themselves to practice law so mm -hmm. they, can, they can have something to do. That's interesting. So before we come to the big one, that is the ICC, International Criminal Court, mm -hmm. let's look at your other um, engagements. I know you had the opportunity to work with the UN and some other universities briefly and then we come to ICC. Yeah. Again, the government of Ghana nominated me to sit as an expert on the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination. It is a committee, it's an expert committee yeah. from different countries, and it is an elective position. So Ghana nominated me, and my name went into the pot, mm -hmm. and there was an election. Mm -hmm. And by God's grace, I was elected to sit on the committee. Mm -hmm. And so I sat on that committee to work on the convention. You know, all member countries of the convention submit a report to the committee, I think on a three-year cycle. Mm -hmm. And so when we sit, we were sitting two or three times a year okay. for three weeks at a time. We examine the report submitted by countries see how far they've gone with bringing their laws in line with the convention mm -hmm. and improving their law and we look at the report make recommendations for improvement and so on. Mm -hmm. I also had the opportunity to teach at various universities okay. um, in Nigeria and in the US mostly. Mm -hmm. but, but back to the UN project so um, when Ghana submitted its proposal, how was, in, in terms of our human rights women uh, record, how did the council greed Ghana? What, what were the well, advantages? Well, uh, Ghana, the I, don't, I don't remember during my time whether we looked at a report from Ghana. Okay. I doubt it. Not when I was there. But which countries report? Was there were a lot of countries that report every year. But the cycle is, I think, three okay. years. Yeah. And in preparing the report, the, like the Ministry of Gender is supposed to consult with all NGOs who are working on women's issues so that they will know what is happening in every corner and submit a report. And then the committee examines the report. There are various aspects of it, HIV, AIDS, human rights, access to health, access to education, uh, access to resources, economic resources and so on. So it's made up of various components mm -hmm. and they take their time to look at each of them. If for example they're looking at access to health mm -hmm. and the report shows that there are so many places, pockets in the country yeah. where people don't have access to health because of lack of roads or lack of clinics mm -hmm. and so on. They will make a recommendation that, you know, please That's look at this area mm -hmm. and ensure that you have proper roads, mm -hmm. you have clinics, you have doctors available, mm -hmm. especially for pregnant women and so on, so that when they are going to have children, they don't suffer. Mm -hmm. Because you see all the, we see the harrowing stories in, on the news where a pregnant woman is put in a wheelbarrow to be transported yeah. to yeah. Uh, a, a clinic or on a, a motorbike to be transported. Mm. Yeah. So, so, so those are the things that we, and the government in preparing the report is expected to consult all the NGOs and civil society organizations so that it's a holistic report. But apart from that, NGOs are also free to okay. submit alternative, what we call alternative report. Because sometimes the government is painting a picture that is beautiful, but underneath, underneath it's not. So the NGOs also present reports mm. which depict or which the allegedly depict the true states of things. Mm. Mm. So it's a very it's a very intensive process, but meant to help mm. all member states to develop and improve the status of their women. Their women, that's mm. impressive. You know, in 2003, I felt so proud when your nomination came up that you've been nominated to the ICC for two reasons. 
uh, one, the fact that you are a Ghanaian, and the second, because you are a woman. You were one of the three women who were actually oh. since there nominated for you. So, how did you receive the news that you've been nominated to be part of that, you know, body, apex body? Let me tell you, mm -hmm. I had worked very hard for the UN, all the UN conferences on women, up to Beijing. Before Beijing, I chaired one of the panels that prepared part of the report, one of the UN committees that prepared part of the platform for action. So I'd worked very hard. And then Beijing had come, all the excitement, and then we had finished. And everything went quiet. I was rather disappointed. Why? Because I thought we were all going to run with the platform for action. And things were going to move. I suppose I was too young. <laughs> <laughs> so when the negotiations for the International Criminal Court started, I had a lot of friends who called me, we are, not, we are not seeing you, are you not participating? Mm -hmm. I said, hey, I'm minding my own <laughs> business. I'm doing my research. Yeah. I have things I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Don't involve me. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be involved. Oh. I'm tired of this running around and you know doing all these things. So I did not participate in the process of the negotiation of the, uh, the treaty. When the treaty was finished in 1998, and they popped champagne, and they finished just at midnight. And they popped a lot of champagne, mm. and then they went to sleep, and everybody said, oh, it will take another 20 years <laughs> before the ICC treaty will come into force. Because yeah. it needed 60 ratifications sure. for it to come into force. Little did they know that it will come into force mm. long before the 20 years of work. And it was partly due to a lot of African countries ratifying. Mm. Africa was responsible mostly for bringing the treaty into being. So in 2002, when the treaty came into being, they moved very fast to nominate there are 18 judges on the court, mm. but nominations don't have to be 18. Every member state can nominate. Okay. So I had a call from the then Attorney General in my office. Okay, what are you doing? I said, I'm very busy in my office. Mm -hmm. I was the dean of the Faculty of Law. Mm. He says, uh, can you come and see me? I said, when today? Mm -hmm. He said, no, I said, no, I can't mm -hmm. because I'm busy doing something. And who was the a a AG there? The current president. Okay. So finally, I think I got there the next day or something. Mm -hmm. Just sit down. Mm -hmm. The president says I should nominate you for the ICC. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> he looked at me and said, minimum. Um, peso ye man. Oh. And you didn't want to do it. I said, why, how can I go to the president and tell him, say, you, you say I should be nominated, and I, I can't do that. He's my father. Mm -hmm. I said, then sign the form. <laughs> <laughs> the president, the current president can be very autocratic. Eh? No, autocratic. Autocratic. Uh, so, reluctantly, I signed the form. Under duress. Not under duress, you know. How would I dare go in front of President Kofi and tell him that he was in my I won't do it. I can't do that. It's not, it's not proper. I, it's so not you weren't happy? You didn't want to do it? I, I didn't even, I hadn't even seen the treaty. I hadn't looked at it. But I agreed because it was just a nomination. Yeah. Finally, you signed. So finally I signed though, and I went, uh, my name was put in the box. Okay. But there were so many other names from, because every member state is entitled to nominate. Okay. So that was in 2002, was the end of 2002, or is it early 2003, I can't remember. That. But in 2003, because I was a member of CEDO, mm -hmm. normally CEDO sits in January, immediately after CEDO. the holiday, mm -hmm. the commission, the expert committee on the elimination of all forms of discrimination okay. against women. Okay. 
the UN body? Uh, yeah, the UN body on which I had been elected. So it sits after the January holidays, then it sits for three weeks. So I was in New York for those three weeks. The ICC elections took place in February, I think either 3rd or 4th of February, I don't remember exactly when. Our ambassador at the UN then was Nana Ifa Pinti. She's a, he's a chief in Ashanti, but he was a professional foreign service, mm -hmm. career diplomat. Mm -hmm. So he did all the lobbying while I, because it all started from 10 o'clock in the morning okay. to 6 p.m. And then after that, we did committee work. Mm -hmm. So sometimes 10 p.m. you are still doing committee wow. work and so on. So we finished, I think, on the 31st of January. And I went to London on the 2nd of February. I think the elections were on the 3rd or the 4th. So when I went to see my children, my two eldest children were in London, were in school. So I went on the 4th, I think. Because of the time difference, it was very early in the morning in London when uh, Ambassador Kwesi Kote called, mm -hmm. said, can you hear us popping champagne <laughs> at the back? I said, why are you popping champagne? <laughs> because you have been elected a judge of the ICC on the first ballot. Whoa. I said, wow. He said, six of you were elected on the first ballot. Mm -hmm. There are 18 judges on the court. Okay. It took another 38 ballots to elect the other 12 judges. Wow. So he said, we are preparing the mm. communique to send to Ghana. Mm. And so it will be in Ghana before the close of day that day. I said, yeah, I'm in trouble. Running through because your mind. <laughs> I hadn't told anybody yeah. apart from very close family, no friends. But my faculty didn't even know. Why, why, why did, did you keep it under? No, it was, it was just a nomination. A nomination doesn't mean that you are there. It's when you are elected. that. Yeah. So for me, there was no need to be telling the world that I've been nominated. If you have been nominated and you don't get elected, then <laughs> what do you do with yourself? It's still so. an achievement, you see. Well, anyway, by the grace of God, I was elected. Mm. And the secretariat of the ICC then was a very small secretary of about four or five people. They were very efficient. They immediately contacted me while I was in London for particulars of my children, my husband, you know. Quickly they had to compile everything because the inauguration was supposed to be on the 10th of March. Wow. We are talking about the 4th of February, so we had very little time to prepare. So I left London. Of course, then I called my husband and said, well, they say I've been elected. <laughs> they see. So please tell my mother. <laughs> because I hadn't told my mother about it. So, you know. By the time I got to Accra Airport, mm. all hell broke loose. Everybody was aware. Because the news was all over oh, the wow. country. So I got out of the plane. No, somebody came <laughs> from the VIP place to get me out of the plane. I said, mm -hmm. why? Mm -hmm. your, your status has changed. <laughs> You're a big woman now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that is history. The rest but of it is history. Uh, let, let's look at some of your achievements at the ICC. What would you well, mention? We were, uh, the inauguration, as I told you, was on the 10th of March. Was supposed to be on it. It was done by Kofi, the, the late Kofi Annan, who was then the Secretary General of Ghana, uh, the, UN. the UN. So I think we went to. I think I went to the Hague on the sixth or seventh of March. And before the inauguration, the court was supposed to elect its presidency because the presidency is responsible for the running of the court, the administrative running of the court. So the election took place, I think on the 8th or 9th of uh, March. It had to be done before the inauguration. 
and I was elected. Hmm, it's, a very <laughs> it's a very interesting <laughs> story. <laughs> I, I, I didn't go there with any idea of standing mm, for mm, position. Any, any position. Mm, but you still but ended up becoming I ended vice up becoming the first pres mm -hmm, vice president vice because president. some of the judges, mm -hmm. a few of the judges had come there. And the story they told, which I didn't believe was that mm. they had heard about me and my, and so on. So they wanted me Your to be Your big there. portfolio. No. So big. You know, so, especially the English judge, mm -hmm. he used to come to me and said, Her Majesty's government mm -hmm. is very proud of you. <laughs> I said, you colonialists, I'm not. <laughs> 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 yeah, things like that in a joking manner but anyway I ended up being elected first vice president mm. which meant yeah. that I had to be in the Hague immediately okay because I had gone for the inauguration and wanted to come, come back. back I was still teaching I had my student you know I had a lot of things to do before anyway I'm on the presidency is made up of the president the first and the second vice president there are three of us the president was from Canada. Mm. I was from Ghana. And the second vice president was from Puerto Rico. She was also a woman. So, when she was retired, you know, so I managed to arrange with her. I came back. I think I went back twice before I finally moved to The Hague. So how many years did you spend there? 12 okay. years. 12 years. Which is a lifetime. Lifetime. And uh, briefly, what would you say were part of your achievements, major policies? I don't that call them achievements. Mm -hmm. It were jobs that I had to do. Okay. We had to set up the court because the court was in existence in name. Mm -hmm. The Dutch government has given us, had moved the Dutch telecom out of one of their buildings and they had given us a building. Okay. But it was just a building. The rooms had no furniture. Mm -hmm. the in fact, the part that we were given, most of it was for summer use, so yeah. they were not even centrally heated, heated, you know. So we had to now, we had poached a secretary from the UN court for Yugoslavia. She's very, very efficient. Yeah. We had poached her and a few others from other places. So we had this call of a small group of people we had to assign officers to the judges. We had to assign officers. We had a registrar. No, had we elected the registrar? Yes, we quickly elected a registrar. We had to get furniture. You know, yeah. we had to really start everything from scratch. Having put the furniture and the computer and things in the rooms, we now had to craft policies okay. to govern yeah, our activity. activities. We had to recruit people. So, of course, we had pushed a human resource person from the UN. You know, the thing is, you just push people from mm -hmm. <laughs> all over yeah. and put a team together. A team together. Mm -hmm. We started recruiting. Mm -hmm. We started... Uh, we didn't have courtrooms yeah. at the building, so they had to commandeer the garage. The garage was an underground garage mm -hmm. for our parking. We had to commanded to use to build courtrooms. We built two courtrooms, one big one and one small one. And they moved the park into about 20 minutes walk away somewhere. And so there was a lot to be done, to be done. a lot. To, to be done, but uh, bef before I take my next break, let me ask you this quick one and then we'll go. You know, I've heard comments to the fact that the ICC was actually set up for African leaders. How true is it, it man? So Prof. <laughs> you have to read the statue. It's a world court. Look at what had happened in um, Yugoslavia, when Yugoslavia broke up. And because of that, the UN has set up a special criminal court for the Yugoslavia to try those who were responsible for the atrocities, the killings and the rapes and the sexual offenses. And then Rwanda came in 1994, mm. the genocide of Rwanda. And because of that, the UN had to set up another court in Arusha mm. to try the perpetrators of the genocide. 
and the idea of an international criminal court had been on the table for long for a long long time and so at that point the UN decided that let us negotiate a treaty okay. to set up an international criminal court so that we don't have to set up every time something went wrong like currently Syria is going wrong okay. are they going to set up a court for Syria and then something goes wrong you set up you keep it's very and a criminal an international criminal court is very expensive sure. very very expensive so the, it wasn't set up for Africa even though Africa of course we are ridden with conflicts and all that it wasn't set up for Africa it was set up for the whole world okay. the whole of the Euro yeah. European Union membership is also part of the ICC of course the big players like the US and in fact the US signed the treaty but never ratified it and Bush claims to have unsigned it but you can never unsign it okay. <laughs> uh, China mm. Russia okay. they are not part of it to begin with UN was the US was vehemently opposed to the court but later on when Obama came everything went That's down of course Trump <laughs> has ratcheted <laughs> has ratcheted <laughs> the opposition again. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, another quick one before I go. Um, DRC's Jermaine Katanga, that case, mm. you stepped down as an appeals judge. Why that decision uh, at the time? When you sit on the court, I sat on, I did Jermaine Katanga's case as a pre-trial judge. Okay. So you cannot sit, having sat as a pre-trial judge, I cannot sit in appeal. Conflict of interest. Conflict of interest. Thank you so much. So I can now take my break. The program is Legends of Our Time on GBC News and Ghana Television. My name is Gifty AJ, and so I'll take a quick break. When I come back, we'll, we'll wrap up. Welcome back. You're still watching Legends of Our Time on GBC News and Ghana Television on Legends of Our Time. We celebrate our hero, and today we are interacting with another hero, a gem, a regem, a regem, and that is a professor, a poor queen here. Prof, now let's uh, get up close in terms of your uh, nuclear family. I learned you've been married for 48 good yes. years. Yeah, July will be 48 years. 48 years with um, three children, and how many grandchildren? Four of them how has the experience been like well you know getting I got married at a very young age as oh, soon yeah. as I finished my master's came back to tea actually yeah that's when I got married and came back so I started my teaching career with having children it was a big challenge very big when you have young children and you have to teach. Um, getting help with the children was not easy. To start with, my aunties insisted that they would bring family from the village to come and help to you. come and help me. It was a big challenge because a lot of these old ladies, my, they are supposed to be my aunties yeah. and so on. All they talked of was going for funerals. So Friday, you come from work. And, and she sparked her back saying that so and so is dead, so they are going to the village, they will come back on Tuesday. What am I supposed to do on Monday and Tuesday? Mm. This went on. I had my first two children. And then one day I came back. It was a Thursday. And my auntie who was looking after them had packed that somebody had died in Suhum or some silly place like that and they, they have to go to the funeral and he'll be away for a week. Hmm. He broke my back. Following day, the children were in um, nursery school, but I couldn't send them to nursery so I took them to work with me. Hmm. Did my work. When I finished, I put them in the car and drove home to a coffin. Wow. My mother saw me, she was very excited, you know. I think she was on holidays as well. They asked me, as soon as I got home, they asked me, I started crying. My stepfather mm -hmm. said, what is it? 
I said the lady, the woman they brought, she's packed or she's going, she's going for a week. What am I supposed to do? Blah, blah, blah. He took one look at my mother and said, you've been teaching for 35 years. You've reached voluntary retirement. Why don't you take a retirement and come and look after the children for her? Oh. My mother said, yes, I had thought about it. Uh -huh. So she put in her notice, <laughs> took a retirement, came to live with us. She saved the situation. Hey, <laughs> I am forever <laughs> grateful for to her. Oh. It was not just for me. Those days, our children, me and my siblings, our children went to research school. So every morning, all we took them. In the afternoon, when they closed from school, they all were all brought to my house. Grandma did homework with them, oh. fed them, oh. bathed them. And then they were picked up by their parents to their homes. Yeah. It was such a great help. Yeah. It got to a point where open day at school, I would drive my mother there. <laughs> Grandma would go, go and sit somewhere and chat. <laughs> she move from <laughs> class to class. <laughs> Being open day with the teachers, <laughs> discussing the work of the children. <laughs> I'll be busy chatting somewhere. <laughs> wow. And then okay. when she's finished, I drive her back home. When I come and they have done their homework, research, the homework has been signed by a parent. Okay. They say, Mommy, you didn't, you didn't do the homework. Mm, Grandma, Grandma did it. Nana, they used to call it. Nana did it. So Nana will sign. So Nana will sign all the homework. Okay. She okay. was such a really. great girl. Yeah. So where are the children today? Today, they are grown-ups with their own. My son is a lawyer. I don't know whether he lives in Ghana or he lives in England. Currently, he's in England, <laughs> <laughs> but he's supposed to be living here. Mm -hmm. My eldest daughter is married to a banker who works in Lagos. Okay, so Nigeria. She lives in Lagos with her. They have a son. My youngest daughter works as the chief operating officer of the African Leadership University, the Harvard of Africa in okay. Mauritius. Okay. She has two children, mm -hmm. a boy and a girl. Mm -hmm. So she and her husband and children live in Mauritius. That's good to know. That's they were all here at Christmas, but they've all gone back. Wow. My son has a son. He lives with me here. Okay. When he pleases the father. <laughs> when he shows up, he'll come and take him. <laughs> so when he's in England, it's fine. Christmas time, as soon as they vacated, we took him to London. They came back only after the holidays. Mm -hmm. So he's in school. Okay. Sure, they've gone to pick him up. He'll be, he'll be down. He's seven. Mm -hmm. My oldest grandchildren are seven, the two boys. Okay. And then five girls. A boy. I have three boys and a girl. Okay. The, bo the, the youngest boy is five, and the girl is five. Wow. Wow. That's good. So this 48 year journey. What would you say has been the secret to the success story? I wouldn't call it a success it story. Is. <laughs> there is no marriage is. that is <laughs> a success story. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the Lord. The Lord. It's believing in God and trusting all your problems to the Lord. And walking as he wants you to walk. And trusting. And trusting him to lead you. Because he has your good at heart. Mm. He's the only being that has your good at heart. Sure. You can trust him absolutely. So he has been your the guiding light. He has been the secret. Mm. The Bible says that he says he hates divorce. Mm. So if you are his child, Divorce is not an option for you. When you have a problem, you go to him. Sorry. You don't talk to him. And when I got married, I remember my mother-in-law of blessed memory. When, when I came home and met her for the first time, he said she had 12 children if you separate twins. Mm. She had lost the two sets of twins. Okay, so four. So, now so she had eight children. Her oldest son's wife 
was his ninth, was her ninth child. Mm -hmm. I am her tenth <laughs> child. She said to me, mm -hmm. you married my son. Mm -hmm. You did not marry me or my husband. Yeah. You didn't marry your sisters-in-law or your brothers-in-law. If anybody comes to your house to throw their weight about, throw them out of the house. <laughs> strong woman. She was a very strong woman. She said, if I come to your house through my work, threw me out of wow. the house. And that helped. If you marriage. have a problem in your marriage, don't talk to your friends about it. Pray about it. Don't come and talk to me about it. Don't go and talk to your mother about it. So I said, why? She said, you see, if you come and tell me, he's my son, I'll side with him. If you go and tell your mother, you are her daughter, she'll side, side with you. And we might make things worse. So don't tell us. Wow, great advice. When you are angry, take time. When things calm down, talk among yourselves. It was great advice that my mother-in-law gave me. I really cherished her mm. because she helped. I always remember her telling me that I didn't marry anybody in the family. <laughs> I married my husband. Yeah. I shouldn't allow the family to come and harass yeah. my life. And one day, I remembered it so vividly. I think it was Easter time. We had visitors. I didn't know them. They were supposed to be my husband's cousins and so on. They didn't know that I speak ever. Yeah. So they were sitting in my living room and insulting me. <laughs> <laughs> and look at her. She has only two children. Hey, she doesn't want to have any more children. Hey, is that one to a problem? My, my husband was there. My husband knew I understood everything, but he knew better than to yeah. tell them anything. So they went on and on and on and on. When I had fed them and given them <laughs> something to drink, they were insulting me. <laughs> so That's a human need <laughs> for you. <laughs> so when they finished and they were leaving, I walked with them and my husband. We got to the kids and I said, don't you ever. I said mm -hmm. it to never. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see you people in this house again, mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I do in my marriage mm -hmm. is none of your business. Yeah. How did you say it? In I said it in never. In never. In never. How did you say it? How did you say it? <laughs> <laughs> and there was consternation. He turned a photo. So your wife understood and mm -hmm. then you didn't. He just turned and walked away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he just walked back to the house. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't want to see people in my house again. How dare you? Mm -hmm. Wow. And I remember when I got married and came to Ghana, we went to Chitu. My husband's mother comes from Chitu. His father comes from Owe in there. Uh -huh. We went to greet my in-laws. Today I'm fat. Those days I was <laughs> lengi, 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 lengi. <laughs> Skinny. Skinny. <laughs> Slim tins. My mother-in-law was, mother was there. Uh, my husband we went to greet my her husband's grandfather was a patriarch with many mm. wives. Had a, he had a big, big house, family. and each of the wives has his own. And they were there, and they all were very nice to me. They greeted me. Then they said, Eh, do a blue via a cover feed. At the school, kaka 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 kaka. Mm -hmm. Leke. <laughs> Leke wajifia mamita. My husband is a terrier. Terrier is do. Mm -hmm. Terrier. This tree girl you've gone to bring <laughs> like this. How mm. is she going to have a baby for her? Hey. <laughs> that was my father, my mother in law was looking about it. I didn't say anything. When we sat in the car, they were all around. I turned to them and said, Name G V D my wife, your name is Lichina Depia. So she understood and you didn't <laughs> tell us. So she was listening to everything that we were saying. She won. Then we sat in the car and <laughs> when that came the next time, he said, You mm -hmm. right girl after my own heart. That's how I love you so much. You did it. <laughs> what was it? It was, it was not their business whether you are big or fat. <laughs> so oh. I I thank the Lord that I spoke ever mm -hmm. fluently. <laughs> And you also had But up to today, mm. maybe this program is going to expose me that I speak. <laughs> there are so many of them who don't know that I speak. You speak ever. 
That's interesting. I also like that inner energy. You see, uh, there's this documentary running on our station, GBC News, on sickle cell, and they featured you. You are sickle cell positive. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you are 73 years. Yes. Still counting. Mm -hmm. How, you know, there's been a lot of myths surrounding the condition that yeah. you can go past 20, 30 years. How did you do it? But things have changed, you know. I was born in 1947. When? 2020. Medicine has changed. Technology has changed. Management has changed. You know, so many things have changed. So you cannot use the assumptions of yesterday years, 100 years ago, to judge children who have sickle cells. So what, what advice would you give to families having this condition? They should take very good care of their children. How? Especially when they are young. Don't expose them to extreme cold. Okay. Don't expose them. It's been changing cold, hot. It's very bad for them. It destabilizes their cells. Okay. You have to feed them very well. Like what, what meals? Give them like nutritious meals. Protein, carbohydrates. Yeah, a balanced meal. Don't feed them fufu only. Feed them vegetables, meats, eggs. A balanced, a normal balanced diet. Okay. Don't push them too much, especially like. if they are SS and so on. Sometimes you say, eh, this one, she is lazy, doesn't want to do any work. When they are going to fetch water, it doesn't go. Me, when I was a child. I never went to fetch water. I have never pounded for food in my life. Your parents understood your, your, your condition? Yeah. They did. Well, I can't say that they understood it. There was very limited knowledge about sickle cell mm -hmm. in those days. Very few people. So in your case, are you SS or CS? I'm SC. SC, okay. There was very little knowledge. But my parents quickly realized that I wasn't that very strong. So I wasn't forced, I didn't wash my things. It was when I was about 10 months ago, my mother insisted I should wash my things. Okay. Me, up to today, if I wash, okay. the back of my nails will okay. all peel off. Here, will be red. Okay. So I don't wash. Okay. I've never pounded for food. I didn't go to fetch water. If I went to the farm, I came back carrying nothing. <laughs> I went to the farm because everybody was going. I enjoyed farm. going. Yeah. But I came back carrying nothing. Nobody forced me to do anything. Yeah. I remember my auntie saying that uh, I was always, my head was always in a book. Bookworm. Because I'm lazy. Oh. But I remember my stepfather telling them that she's not lazy. She has her abilities. Yeah. Just leave her alone. So we shouldn't push these children. Okay. One time I wanted a nanny, and a girl, a young girl, she was about 20, was brought to me. When I saw her eyes, I asked the mother whether she was okay. I said, oh, she's fine. Four days, she was ill. So I asked, I started interrogating her. I realized that she was a sickler, but nobody had tested her. Wow. Nobody had done. So I sent for the mother. Sent them to Kolebu to go and have her tested. To see. And then I gave the mother a long list of do's and don'ts. And I said, if you do that, this girl will flourish. Yeah. But don't take her to go and live with anybody. Okay. Okay. Because I know what is yeah. wrong. I could immediately sense it when I saw her. The mother was very grateful, but of course I didn't follow up, so I don't know whether what, what has happened to her. And it is not something that I think about. Or, in fact, sometimes I don't even talk about it. Yeah. I went to the Hague for 12 years. Nobody knew what my medical condition was. Wow. It's none of, it was none of their business. It was none of their business. And I never had a crisis. I didn't fall ill. I mean, I had flu like everybody else and so things like that, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and I do not admit to being a sickler. Amen. 
for the blood of Jesus has taken all of that away. Amen. 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 We are friends. So, what what makes you happy as a person, Professor? What makes me happy? Yeah. What turns you on? Music. I love music. Gospel. But I religion. like gospel music. I like uh, country music. I love country music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I listen to it a lot. Mm -hmm. Makes me happy. Makes you happy. Briefly, just one like your Ekua Kwenye here Foundation. What, what's happening? I can't say it in one line. <laughs> so right. you better make sure that it all goes in. <laughs> because <laughs> it stems from my mother. Okay. A teacher with very little salary. But she used to look after a lot of children. Mm. People who couldn't go t to school because they couldn't pay. She paid for them to go to school. When I came back to teach, she started pushing them to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, mm. As soon as his daughter has to go to school. Push, push her. Push her. So I started, I started looking after children from the village, girls mostly. But I have a couple of boys who finished Cape Coast University. So on the average, how many? Um, SSS children? was quite expensive. So I was doing about four in a cycle. Okay. I couldn't do more than that because it was quite expensive. Yeah. So when I turned 60, my son and his, bra his sisters came up with the idea of forming this foundation because they said, Mommy, we can then raise funds okay. and look after more girls. Okay. So it's a girl child it's policy a girl concept, child. kind of. It's a, a foundation that looks after brilliant but needy girls. And it is open to the whole country. We have girls from every part of the mm -hmm. country. I didn't limit it to Aquapim or to my village. Mm -hmm. We have girls from the north, Ashanti, Bronghaf, or mm -hmm. eastern region, mm -hmm. western, central, everywhere. Mm -hmm. So, but they have to be very poor. Very poor. Needy. Which means I don't qualify. Of course, you, you don't qualify. qualify. No. Okay. Okay. The girls we look after, our motto is we are changing Ghana one girl at a time. Wow. They are from very poor backgrounds, but they are brilliant. Last year, we had a girl graduating from tech in aeronautical engineering, first mm. class. Wow. We had two girls from Legon, first class. Wow. We had Cape Coast, second upper. Our oh. girls don't do third class. <laughs> they all come up. But we look after them from secondary school. Mercifully now, SHS is free. It's free. So we are garnishing, harnessing our resources to help Invest. with tertiary okay. education. That's very because wonderful. originally we didn't start with tertiary because okay. we didn't have money. Mm -hmm. The SSS was quite expensive. expensive. Mm -hmm. But now we are trying because SHS, we don't spend so much money on them. Mm -hmm. so. And we take girls from all over the country. Mm. And now we even have a waiting list. My <laughs> daughter, my oldest daughter is the executive director <laughs> of, she the runs, foundation. She, of the foundation. She says, mommy, don't accept anybody. <laughs> One time they made a mistake of making me conduct the interview and I took everybody. <laughs> everybody passed. I like everybody that. <laughs> I like that. Prof, Equa Queen here. Thank you so much for your time. Thank Indeed. You. It's an honor talking to you. And uh, Ghana is so proud of you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ma. I hope God is also proud of me. Oh, sure. That's well, that's, uh, that's, well the that's the most important. Only, that's the most important. We can one. only be hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, the program has been Legends of Our Time on GBC News and Ghana Television. My name is Gifty AJ, and my guest for today has been a former judge to the ICC, Professor Ikwa Kweni here. Thank you so much for watching. We'll come your way same time next week. Until then, bye for now.